Where are we? About to link up with Waddington. And we're on. A control room is a place where complex systems are watched and manipulated by multiple operators, usually seated at consoles and facing a bank of screens. The control room is a unique mix of machines, architecture, monitors, bodies, laws, procedures, protocols and hierarchies. The history of the control room in cinema and television can tell us a lot about how power works and how it changes, because power is always expressed through the technologies of a given era. The earliest control rooms date to the 1920s and remained more or less unchanged except perhaps in scale for the next 50 years. But from the early 1970s, change comes fast. And looking back, we can see the emergence over this period of many of the key technological phenomena of the digital age. Virtualization, remote control, simulation, real-time processing, network computing, and a world in which every screen has become a graphical user interface. As the missile screams toward target, radar keeps on tracking. With electronic control... The... It was in the 1960s that the control room arrived into the public consciousness as a place from which great technological enterprises were managed, such as air defence, space travel, and nuclear power generation. One of many successful tests of the same... Two cinema releases from 1971 mark the starting points for our purposes here. In the BioThreat Lab in the Andromeda strain, the built-in, furniture-like screens and the consoles of the control room convey the notion of solidity and long-term planning, while the blinking array of levers, dials, display panels and buttons convey a sense that a hardwired, purpose-built piece of engineering is under control. Radiation rate is five. The control room screens of THX 1138, a film also released in 1971, are used to monitor every aspect of those who labour in the high-tech laboratory factories. The screens feature either the live feeds from surveillance cameras or simple graphical displays. By the late 1970s, we see the arrival of the home computer for hobbyists. Mainframes, that is, room-sized, purpose-built computers, become gradually less visible. When they are seen, such as in War Games, released in 1983, they are modular, in other words, adaptable, updatable, and not entirely hardwired. The personal computer brought new narrative possibilities, where the hub of the action is often a teenage hacker with a computer hooked up to a telephone in his bedroom. What is also new by 1983, the graphical simulations of missile strikes on the array of world maps are in motion. They are accompanied by electronic bleeps and blinking lights that accentuate its computational activity, its liveness. In the late 1980s and early 90s, the technologies of satellites, high-speed data streams and high-resolution live-action cameras become more commonplace and we move into the era of live-feed war. In the post-Cold War period, the enemy is no longer a monolithic superpower and the control room becomes the place from which direct military intervention in the form of a covert operation is watched live on screen. Where are you taking me, Marty? It's you who've taken us, Jack. Satellite now entering target area. Into battle. Sir. In this landmark scene from Patriot Games, Harrison Ford's character, a CIA analyst, enters the control room for the first time. This is 1992, only one year after the world became familiar with very similar footage from the first Gulf War. 35 seconds. That is a kill. So the consternation on Ford's face registers his moral confusion at this extrajudicial killing. In an earlier scene, he himself singled out this camp in the North African desert as containing Irish terrorists, but he didn't expect his decision to lead to this. 
His doubt also concerns his own role as observer and participant in what we might call his ontological relationship to the events that are unfolding before him. He is in a technological feedback loop that frightens him, and it is repugnant to his liberal instincts. The 1990s are also the period when first-person shooter video games appear, such as Doom and Wolfenstein 3D. The emphasis in this period, in the 1992 film Universal Soldier, for example, is towards miniaturization, live uplinks, mobility of combatants, and cyborgization. In A Sign of the Times, the control room in this film is in a truck. The control rooms in general in this period become more mobile, more versatile, and more capable of being repurposed. Pretty ugly. The period since the end of the Cold War has witnessed a growing tendency to view the world and narratives about the world in line with what in military discourse is called command and control. The term refers to the application of cybernetic thinking to military affairs, whereby decisions are made on the basis of feedback loops of information that are made possible by communication technologies. And it is those very communication technologies that are under attack in control room narratives of recent decades. We're under attack. Disrupting control means taking command. In Die Hard 4, even the government agency for cyber security is vulnerable. The villains are sophisticated hackers who attack the entire technological apparatus of society seizing control of everything from traffic lights to cable television to the electricity grid to data itself. If technological power as such is at stake rather than control over any particular building or room. It's a three-step. The response is a combination of brawn in the person of the technophobic Bruce Willis and highly adaptable hacker skills in the person of Justin Long who uses handheld devices and laptops to take control back. The struggle is to control the meta control room that controls all others. Bond. Yes? Name check. Shifts in control room technologies are connected to new attitudes towards threats to security. Particularly in big budget productions, the contemporary control room is increasingly more flexible, less material, and more transparent. As in Avatar, as in Iron Man 3 where the instrumentation of the control room may also be rendered as a heads-up display. No sign of cardiac anomaly or unusual brain activity. Aside from these miniaturizing and dematerializing tendencies, control rooms themselves do continue to proliferate in more modestly budgeted films and television shows, often with a seductive emphasis on the capacities of computing to sift and crunch reams of data. But whatever the budget, the greatest threat to security is no longer from a nuclear-armed monolith or from a space race rival, but rather from the highly adaptable, shifting, networked phenomena of terrorism or cyber attack. The more general the threat and the looser the definition of terrorism, the greater the need for the control room to have access to all possible resources to combat it. That was fast. It's still going on. Fuck. Fuck. What is it? Extraordinary political situations or states of exception such as are in effect in every moment of shows like 24 and Homeland, have the effect of rushing screen narratives into a state of frenzy. There is always a finger hovering over a firing button, always a go command ready to be issued. In a state of perpetual conflict readiness, the technological, political and military situations become fused. In fact, the era of always-on military defence began in earnest in World War II which saw the first steps in the dual process of the weaponization of media and of the mediatization of weapons. Since then, war, if not actually engaged, is always virtually engaged. This process has accelerated in the period since 1971 that we have covered here, as the crisis, the exceptional situation, has become normalized. It's over.